I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and gather today, the Gadigal of the Eora Nation, and pay our collective respects to elders past and present. Of Sovereignty was never ceded, and this, uh, this was and always will be Aboriginal land. And I'm really looking forward to, at the closing of today, having a really special cultural ceremony um, by our First Nations communities here to hand over to Capital Pride, so please make sure you do stick around until the end of today's proceedings. Okay, here we have a panel of incredible individuals to talk to you about the topic of international human rights law and its role in achieving change for our communities. International human rights law is, uh, is the bedrock, really, of the human rights system. It's founded in the UN system and it's really the philosophical framework that guides all of our discussions this week. But this is, I think, the only session in the conference on the law itself. We've had two fantastic workshops, one on utilising UN mechanisms yesterday um, by ILGA World on Outright International and a workshop on strategic litigation run by uh, Human Dignity Trust and Equality Australia. But today is an opportunity for a larger group to hear from some renowned experts and advocates in the field about some theory, but also some practical examples of how we can use the law to affect change. I'm going to introduce our speakers as they stand up and address you one by one. Uh, and then we'll have some time for Q&A. We are due to finish at 1.45 and that's when uh, Michael needs to leave, um, but we will have a bit of time for some extra questions, I've been told, if people do want to uh, stick and hang around for an extra five or ten minutes. Um, so without further ado, I will introduce our first speaker, who's probably well known to many of you, Professor Paula Gerber. She is a leading academic in human rights. Uh, she's written and published extensively on this topic, particularly on LGBTIQ plus rights. Um, she also happens to practice in other areas like construction law, but we're not so interested in that today. Um, I'm in the wrong place. <laughs> um, but she's, be prepared, she is a teacher, so you may uh, be thrown a few curveballs as her students for today. Um, but I'll, I'll really warmly welcome Paula to speak to you now for about 10 minutes. Thank you. And while Paula... While Paula gets ready, just a reminder that, like all the sessions, you can submit questions on Slido using the app. So I'll, I'll get them fed up to me down here, and I'll be able to ask them at the end, uh, if time permits, and it will, because I'll be timing time, everyone yes. down to the minute. Go ahead, Paula. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'd like to begin by paying my respects to the traditional owners of the land on which we're gathered today, and to echo what Anna said, these lands were never ceded. I'd like to go a step further, though, and encourage you to all do a bit of um, research and get informed about The Voice. We're going to have a really significant referendum in this country um, about amending our constitution and I feel as strongly about getting a yes in this referendum as I did about getting a yes in marriage equality. So I'm going to take every opportunity to really um, encourage you to, to find out uh, what the truth is about this because there's a lot of myths um, going around that are trying to derail this this important law reform. Okay, we're in the second last session on the third day of this conference, and it's been pretty passive. We've been sitting in the audience out, you know, hearing great stuff, having our, our minds expanded, but I decided to make uh, my session a bit more uh, interactive. I'm going to ask if I can get the lights turned up a little bit on the audience, please, because I'm going to be asking you some questions. Now, I know we've got a lot of um, people here from overseas, and it occurred to me that maybe you haven't had the pleasure of trying caramel like koala. <laughs> so, I am rewarding correct answers to my questions. So, hands up in the air, no calling out the answers. Uh, first one, it's a pretty easy one. Uh, I want to know, when did the UN Human Rights Committee find that criminalising same-sex sexual conduct was a breach of international human rights law? I need the, the name of the case and the year. Yes. Very good. We have our first camera. <laughs> I always hate it when people up the back answer correctly. Thank you, because I threw it really badly. <laughs> 
Okay, how many UN Treaty Committee decisions involving LGBTIQ rights have been with Australia as one of the parties? So we know Tunin's one of them, how many more are there? No one want to have a stab? Yes. Which one? Uh, yes, 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 yes. Did you say? Okay, I'm going to go through them. So Tunin is one. Young is another. Edward Young, he claimed that he had been denied the veterans' pension when his partner died. Uh, because it was a same-sex relationship. The UN committee said, yes, you're right, that's a breach of international human rights law. Unfortunately, the Veterans Affairs Department then just found another reason to deny Edward Young getting the pension. They said he, he, his partner hadn't died from a war-related injury, uh, so the outcome wasn't entirely good. Campbell was the 2017 case, denial of the right to divorce for same-sex couple that had married in Canada they're Australian, came back to Australia, wanted to get a divorce, and the court, uh, the, um, court said, no, we can't, we can't divorce you because it's not an Australian marriage. And the final one also in 2017 was G in Australia, where they, um, the government requiring Miss G to get a divorce from her um, different sex marriage in order to change the gender on her, the sex on her birth certificate was also held to be a breach of human rights. All right, next question. What are the three mechanisms that UN treaty bodies can use to encourage states to, uh, to reform their laws? So we know we've got communications on uh, individual complaints like Tunin, so that's number one. What are the other two outputs from UN treaty committees? Okay, I'm going to be eating a lot of chocolate tonight. <laughs> Concluding observations from, from the committee where they review countries' compliance, implementation of a treaty, and then general comments, which are these, uh, and they tend to average annually, statements from the committee interpreting uh, specific provisions of, the, of a treaty. All right, I reckon someone's going to get this one right. Which country last week the, had a court rule that the NGO Coordination Board could not deny registration to an LGBT organisation. Kenya, who said that? Okay, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> Which UN Treaty Committee almost one year ago ruled that Sri Lanka was in breach of international human rights law CEDAW Committee, thank you. I reckon I can throw it that far. <laughs> okay, which country is the one that most recently struck down laws criminalising consensual same-sex sexual conduct? Singapore. Singapore is the second most recent. You don't get a chocolate fat. <laughs> who, who said Barbados? Okay, give it to Alistair down the back. <laughs> oh, that's worse than me. <laughs> okay, um, last question, and I, I'll be impressed if anyone gets this right. What is Demis Prudence? Demis Prudence, D-E-M-O-S-P-R-U-D-E-N-C-E, -E -E. Demis Prudence, anyone heard of it? Okay, well let me tell you a story that explains it. There was an academic, a sociologist from New York, and in 1996, his name was Tom Stoddard, 1996 he decided to go to New Zealand and he thought he was going to a gay utopia because on the books New Zealand had decriminalised, it had anti-discrimination laws that included sexual orientation, gender identity and so on the books it looked like it was a gay mecca. He went there and he discovered that it was like going to an American state 20 years earlier. And he came up with this concept of Demis Prudence, which is this idea of the push-pull effect of law and culture. So you can shift the law, but if the culture doesn't change, it's not going to have much of an effect on the day-to-day -day lived experience of LGBTIQ people. 
and you can shift the culture, but if the law doesn't keep in step, again, it's out of sync, it's out of whack. So what you want is to have societal attitudes and the law moving in sync. And another example I'll give, and we've got Edwin Cameron here in the audience, is South Africa. First country in the world to include sexual orientation in its constitution. And it is still a very dangerous place for LGBTIQ people to live because of the violence and the homophobia that exists in society. So the law has, has moved society along a bit, but there's further to go. All right, so in my time remaining, I'm not sure how long I've got, I want to talk about how international human rights law, the sort of cases that we've talked about, can help achieve reform at the domestic level. And I'm, I'm going to do that through talking about a theory called the boomerang theory of advocacy. Now, I wish I could claim that I came up with that name because I think it's a great name, but I didn't. It was developed by two Americans, uh, Catherine Sicken and Margaret Kirk uh, from Harvard University and John, John Hopkins University, respectively. But it's a very apt name, boomerang advocacy, because what it is saying is that sometimes it is too dangerous and difficult for local advocates to lobby government for change. So you throw a boomerang. And what does a boomerang do? It comes back again. So you throw your boomerang out to the UN, human rights system, and you get them to, as the theme of today, amplify your arguments and your advocacy. And the case study I want to use, I mean, I could use many for this. Tunin is obviously one example. Sri Lanka and Marozana's case is another. But I'm going to use the example of Poland and hate crime laws in Poland. Poland, as I'm sure many of you know, is a European country that has really gone backwards in terms of protecting the rights of LGBTQI people. So there are a number of cities, municipalities in Poland that have declared themselves to be LGBTIQ free zones. And it is a very hostile environment for LGBTIQ people. So they have almost given up trying to lobby the government for law reform. And the particular one that they're after at the moment is, is hate crimes law. So that if a crime is motivated by homophobia, transphobia, biphobia, a, a heftier sentence is imposed. They went to the UN seven times between 2007 and 2018. They went twice to the Human Rights Committee, twice to the Human Rights Council, twice to the Torture Committee, and then also to the Disability Committee. And each time they got recommendations from those bodies in their concluding observations, in their uh, recommendations following the Universal Periodic Review, that Poland amended its, law, amended its laws to enact hate crime laws. And that message constantly being fed back to the government, the government being named and shamed on the international stage, has seen a shift in the thinking. They don't yet have hate crime laws, but the opposition to it, the resistance to it, is diminishing. So this is what international human rights law can do. It can provide you with a tool to assist in achieving reform at the local level when such reform is not possible through a more direct route. So it's essentially echoing the concerns of the, of the activists and the advocates in the community back to the government via the UN. And um, I will end by saying that uh, another hat I wear, in addition to being a professor at Monash Law School, is that I'm on the board of Kaleidoscope Human Rights Foundation. And our special skill is assisting uh, activists in the Asia-Pacific region to write shadow reports, to write um, briefs to the UN. We've got a great team of experienced lawyers and uh, we are happy to provide training and to assist in writing shadow reports and we've enjoyed a fair bit of success from this. We've seen the UN committees actually cut and paste paragraphs out of the shadow reports that we've written and put it into their concluding observations. And they are very grateful to get these shadow reports because if they don't get shadow reports from civil society, then all they've got to go on is the government's reports. And we all know that they're hardly impartial and uh, unbiased in the way that they paint the compliance with uh, the treaty. So shadow reports play a very vital role. They're very much appreciated by the under-resourced UN treaty committees 
and um, I'd welcome the opportunity to, to work with activists in this region on, um, on using that mechanism. So come and see me later if you want a chocolate because I've got lots left over. <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> That was wonderful and some real practical insights as well as theory for the audience there. Um, now, Caramella Koalas don't travel like tennis balls, I discovered, and so sorry <laughs> to whoever I hit in the audience. And hopefully that's enough exercise for me this session. Um, now, our next spe speaker is Rosanna um, Flamer Caldera from Sri Lanka. Uh, she is the Executive Director of Equal Ground and, as you've heard already, um, spearheaded the groundbreaking complaint all the way back in 2018. It was initiated with the help of Human Dignity Trust and Rosanna is going to talk to you now about that experience because I'm sure many of you um, working out there on the ground as activists could learn from how such a complaint is actually, you know, the practicalities of how it's initiated and learn also about the ho hopeful impact as a result of using treaty bodies in the way that Rosanna has. Um, congratulations also, what an incredible result um, and please Share with us your thoughts and reflections. Thank you. Thank you very much. I've got to say I'm a bit awestruck sitting next to these two August people, and I can't follow this act with throwing chocolates all over the place. Do not expect any candy. I try and sugarcoat my words as much as possible. That's all you'll get, yeah? Um, I think I need to start by uh, saying why, what was the reason behind me going through this process with the uh, CEDAW case. Um, Sri Lanka, of course, thanks to the British, have got all colonial laws, 365 and 365A of the Penal Code. Um, in 1995, the law was amended because the Justice Minister at that time decided that it was gender biased. So they dropped the word male person. And this was um, in answer to a private member's bill that was put in parliament by a very astute parliamentarian at that time, uh, Mr. Neelan Chirutelvam. And so what happened? We all got involved in this case. So we, Sri Lanka is one of, I think, uh, I'm not sure how many countries uh, that criminalizes uh, consenting adults, same-sex relationships between women. The other issue with um, Sri Lanka is that in 1978, they changed uh, the constitution um, and said basically they put in a savings law clause, Article 16, saying that any law that was enacted before 1978 cannot be changed in a court of law. It has to be changed by parliament. So that's like uh, pushing Ayers Rock uphill for 25 miles, yeah? That's never going to happen, or so we think. So um, we Obviously, our organization has been involved in sensitizing, educating, uh, basically trying to change the mindset of the people in Sri Lanka because no law, um, no amount of pushing uh, legally can change the way people think about the LGBTIQ community in Sri Lanka. So that was part of our strategy. Uh, the second strategy was also to educate and, and um, you know, uh, sensitize our own community to come out, to be proud of who they were instead of always being in the shadows, always hiding. So the result of that you can see now with so many different uh, LGBT organizations on the ground and so on. Anyway, getting back to the CEDAW case, um, in 2014, uh, I met with the Human Dignity Trust who said, hey, this is a great uh, uh, time to maybe think about you know, doing a case at CEDO. And why at CEDO? Because Tunan had already made huge ripples in, in the uh, HRC, ICCPR. So, um, and you know, it's about women as well, CEDO. And since this is a law that is impacting women in Sri Lanka, lesbian, bisexual, queer women in Sri Lanka, CEDO was the next best thing, not the next best thing, but the best thing for us to, so then we could have two decisions at the UN uh, regarding decriminalization. Yeah? Um, it wasn't like, oh, we did this and you know, we just went and filed the case. No, uh, four years down the line, a lot of slogging with you know, testimony, testimonies and fact checking and you know, putting all of the stuff together and then presenting it to the three amazing women barristers that actually you know, wrote the case uh, took four years. 
and we finally presented it in 2018 to the CEDAW committee. And in uh, February of 2022, so four years down the line again, uh, we finally got the decision, which was just great. Uh, I couldn't have asked for a better decision. Um, so they asked for decriminalization, of course, of same-sex relationships. Uh, they also asked the um, government, which was, I thought, really fabulous and is never going to happen, that uh, I'm allowed to advocate and, and continue with my advocacy without any kind of harm or molestation. My organization should be also the same, that they shouldn't have any uh, reason to you know, harass us uh, or discriminate against us and that I should be awarded all this stuff. And I'm not sure what this stuff means. <laughs> yeah. I haven't seen any money. Yeah, <laughs> no money. Um, so, four, be. yeah, yeah. It'll be another four years, <laughs> yeah. Um, in the meantime, however, there was another private member's bill put into uh, parliament uh, last year, uh, asking to amend 365 and 365A. Um, I don't know, I understand why these parliamentarians always want to amend this old British law. It has caused lots of problems before. It will probably start giving us problems again. And I'm going to just finish off here by saying that um, a, just in January, uh, due to uh, pressure from the, uh, U, through the UPR at the Human uh, Rights Commission, um, the Sri Lanka foreign minister said that Sri Lanka is going to decriminalize homosexuality, but will not... Um, uh, agree to same-sex marriage. I think if that happens, one step at a time, we'll hit them with same-sex marriage somewhere down the long <laughs> line. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rosanna. I know I'm sure the audience has lots of questions, um, but we'll move on to now Michael to hear from you for 15 minutes or however long you like, um, because, <laughs> let's, <laughs> because let's face it, um, Michael is uh, a human rights icon for our community. He's a luminary, international jurist, obviously was um, on our highest court here in Australia for a number of years, and that follows to, followed a distinguished career as a jurist and at the bar, but also as chairman of the Australian Law Reform Commission. Um, the list goes on. Uh, but Michael is, is <laughs> <laughs> and Michael is so um, generous with his time and uh, patronage. Um, he's a patron of Equality Australia, as well as a number of other important community organisations, including Kaleidoscope. And he always makes the time to speak to students, to pass on his knowledge. Um, we're so grateful to have him as part of our community. And he really has been a trailblazer. So please... Um, join with me in welcoming Michael and his remarks. Coming to this uh, conference uh, caused me to reflect upon the very different nature of Australian society today uh, from uh, when I was growing up and being educated and becoming a young man and a sexual person. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, I reflect upon uh, the journey that we've taken. And we have made many great improvements. And one of them is just being here at this very large conference and talking about an issue that was completely taboo uh, in my uh, childhood and youth. I never really felt that I was second class or that I was um, really an evil uh, or abominable person. Uh, fortunately, my life coincided with the Kinsey Report. And the Kinsey Report in 1944 and, f and 51, I think, uh, those two reports on sexuality in the human male and human female revealed uh, to anybody who bothered to read about it, and that meant millions of people in Australia, uh, that uh, the hatred against gay people was simply irrational and it was unscientific. And therefore, in my inner being, I never really caught on with the propaganda that churches and others were teaching about how evil and wicked it was. 
Uh, but um, it was a dangerous place and uh, there were um, police and other harassments uh, and therefore you had to effectively tell lies and you had to become an actor and you had to pretend. And I was pretty good at doing all of the above. <laughs> uh, and then in 1969, I met my partner, Johan. I met him at the Rex Hotel up in the King's Cross. <laughs> Some of the older members of the audience will remember the Rex. Uh, it was one of the few uh, venues for gay men. And um, uh, I, I nearly killed the whole thing at the first question. I was reading a book on um, von Ribbentrop. And uh, I heard this voice and I looked at this beautiful man in front of me. And I said, what, what were your views on von Ribbentrop? Because I thought, <laughs> that was my opening pitch. <laughs> and um, I, it was doubly wrong uh, because uh, he was from the Netherlands. And uh, the Nether in the Netherlands, they want their bikes back and they did, didn't like the occupation and Johan lived through the German occupation. So it wasn't a good step. Uh, and... Um, Amazingly, uh, we went to my home in Kirribilli. Um, I don't remember the first kiss, uh, but I remember lots of other things about it, but we won't go there. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, that was in 1969. Amazing, isn't it? Uh, and uh, at 54 years into our relationship, <laughs> ultimately... <laughs> Uh, ultimately, after the marriage equality in Australia, for which I thank all those who struggled for it, and they were put through hoops that was really wrong, uh, and we must never forget the wrong that was done to discriminate against uh, LGBTIQ people, uh, trying to kill it at birth. But uh, after marriage equality came, uh, we had a serious talk about whether we would get married, because on one view, we didn't really need a piece of paper from government to tell us that we uh, had a, a very good and wonderful relationship, but we got married, and we actually got married on the 50th anniversary to the day and the hour that we had first met, just to prove how, to prove how uh, sentimental and romantic we still were about our relationship. Uh, and uh, tonight he's coming to a function uh, and i am be proud to acknowledge his role uh, in my uh, participation in this uh, revolution. It's nothing less than a revolution. Now, uh, I have a very interesting and long association with international law and it would take uh, much longer than the time that is allocated. And I know Anna is a really a tyrant with the time <laughs> is. So, so uh, in the hope of getting a chocolate, uh, <laughs> I, I will try to stick to my time. First of all, um, the, how I got involved in, uh, in uh, international activity was through civil society. I became... Uh, a member, and then an executive member, and then a, the president of the International Commission of Jurists. And at that last time, I decided we had to put LGBTIQ rights on the agenda of the International Commission of Jurists. And it has become one of the leading organisations, along with Amnesty International and the IBA and so on. Uh, and I remember when I raised it uh, as president, I said, we've got to put this on the agenda. We've also got to put HIV AIDS on the agenda and we've got to put technology on the, and the law on the agenda. And I uh, spread all these ideas out and a very fine lawyer from uh, Ghana, whose name was Kofi Kumado, uh, he said, uh, I'll give you um, uh, technology and the law. I'll even give you... HIV, uh, because in Africa we have plenty of HIV patients uh, and human rights, but uh, please, please do not add sexuality and the law. 
we don't have any gay people, we don't have any such people in Africa, and we don't want to have the ICJ ruined in Africa by uh, this uh, trend in some countries, so please drop it. And I said, well, I'm sorry, and I'm glad that you agree with all the rest of my program, but um, I, I do feel that this should be on. I never at that stage said, this affects me. You are insulting me, and you're insulting people like me. That wasn't the way things were done in those years. But uh, ultimately, the ICJ put it on the agenda, and other international human rights organisations picked it up, and it was effectively trying to spread the messages uh, of LGBTIQ human rights uh, through civil society, because civil society was much more friendly to the issue than was um, the par parliament or the courts. Then, uh, later on, um, I became involved in the AIDS epidemic. Uh, and that was a sort of code language for my sexuality. And it made me see how trivial and insignificant was my situation as against the worldwide crisis of HIV and AIDS. Uh, but it also led me to take part in what was probably the most important thing I did in my whole life, which wasn't in Australia, but was in India. And I see Edwin Cameron is in the audience, a really great jurist, a member of the South African Constitutional Court. Let us acknowledge him. Anyway, Edwin and I were invited by a fine civil society activist, straight man, uh, Anand Grover, in uh, India, to come on a series of conferences involving judges in India. And because we were both senior judges in South Africa and Australia, the judges turned up in large numbers and they sat there and they listened to how we explained that it was important to get rid of these British laws that had been imposed by the colonial power uh, and that uh, that would be helpful in the struggle against HIV. Uh, but uh, I uh, was open about my sexuality uh, and uh, the Chief Justice of India and others were were sympathetic and supportive, and eventually this uh, worked a, a revolutionary change in thinking in high legal circles, which can be often very influential. And uh, the net result of that was a long struggle in the courts of India, and uh, eventually, in a case called Jovar against the Union of India, the Supreme Court of India struck down the um, uh, criminalisation of gay uh, sex in India. And also, it's now on the path to bringing before the Supreme Court the issue of marriage equality. And it's all done in the name of equality, an Indian constitutional provision. We don't have that in Australia, so we had to struggle through the parliamentary process. But finally, I want to tell a story about against myself, because... Um, when Nick Toonan and Rodney Croom, who were then domestic partners, as well as partners in the endeavour to get uh, changes in Australian law, when they rang me up, and I was then the President of the Court of Appeal of New South Wales, and this was not a matter that could ever come before uh, the New South Wales courts, they asked me for two things. One, some money, because they were going to take their cause to the Human Rights Committee established under the uh, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and two, uh, to um, provide support. And I said, uh, I'll give you some money, uh, but I can't really, in all conscience, support your taking this to uh, New York and Geneva, because there is a principle in international jurisprudence that if you are not actually being penalised and punished, uh, it's not ripe for consideration by international uh, tribunals. And they said, thank you very much, Justice Kirby, for your advice, and thank you, we're very grateful for that, and especially for your money, uh, <laughs> but we're going ahead. And uh, they immediately uh, brought their proceedings by fax in those days, and they, um, uh, they uh, approached the Human Rights Committee and they won. 
And that proves how courage is so important in these matters. If you never do anything, if you never stand up, if you never take an initiative, if you won't take risks, if you won't take risks that you will fail, or worse, that you'll be uh, punished in a serious way, that uh, is something which sets the cause back. So this is my little story of involvement in international human rights and Nick Turnan and Rodney Croom established uh, the principle in the international level and then I was appointed to the High Court of Australia and lo and behold in the first week of my sitting in the High Court there was a case called Croom against Tasmania <laughs> seeking to rely on the Human Rights Committee in the High Court of Australia. Uh, and a point was taken that they didn't have standing to pursue the matter. And I uh, uh, was asked uh, by the registrar to sit in the case, and I said, no, I can't sit in the case. Uh, why? why? You, you're here and we expect you to sit. This is an important case. And I said, I'm afraid I gave some money and I also gave some advice. So it's a deep principle of our jurisprudence that you don't... Uh, take part. The judge who's had some contact uh, is deemed to be influenced by that contact and therefore I didn't take part. That was what professionalism required. Uh, but um, the lesson may be that you have to be careful if you're in high public positions. But on the other hand, you've got to be brave. And in this audience today and in this conference, uh, and in our country and in the world, there are many brave people who have pushed forward this revolution and I hope uh, greater changes will be achieved in many countries besides Australia. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, now, you are you were due to leave at one forty-five. Do you want to stay for a couple of questions, or do you want to? Sure. Yep. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, Only if I get another chocolate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> chocolate, please. Yeah. If you answer it right, Paul will give you a chocolate. Um, <laughs> I've got some questions here from the audience. The Caramello Koala Challenge showed that our legal knowledge conf and confidence in articulating it can be lacking. How can advocates upskill to help them make change? Um, come and do a master's in international human rights law at Monash <laughs> University. You'll get more chocolates. Um, no, look, there are lots of um, training opportunities out there. A lot of civil society organisations do um, provide training. I know Kaleidoscope did one for um, Pacific Youth a few years ago, uh, funded by the US Equality Fund. Um, and there are helpful guides out there. So, I mean, I don't want to make this an ad for Kaleidoscope, but Kaleidoscope has published a guide about how to use, for example, the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights to advance LGBTIQ rights, because we tend to all think about decriminalisation and civil and political uh, rights, but in fact, economic, social and cultural rights, the right to health, the right to housing, the right to education, to welfare, they all fall under the... the Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, and I think that's an underutilised part of international human rights law. So um, get on Google and uh, do, some, do some searching or come to Monash. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, issue, the issue is basically how do we use the tool of international human rights in ordinary litigation. And it is happening. I used to propound it in the High Court. I didn't really pick up much support there. But there's a very important recent decision in the Land Environment Court of New South Wales. Uh, and that, uh, the judge there, in a case that involved uh, Adani uh, coal uh, development of a very scenic area, the judge drew on the Paris Accord. And the willingness of judges of the new age to do that is growing. And it requires advocates 
and it requires persistence and it requires courage. Thank you, Michael. I think we've got a question from Greg here, so I'm just going to see Greg. I was wondering how the disabled LGBT community, I know it's a wrong struggle, but the disabled LGBT community, I am a member, I am an ambassador for the Pride Centre in Melbourne. In the, in the last 10 years, <coughs> the disability community has made remarkable, remarkable advances, mainly because in Melbourne you see me as a <laughs> <laughs> That's right, Greg. I think your visibility in Victoria is in, has had an incredible impact. Yeah. Um, yeah. And well done. Yeah. Can I put that together? Yeah. Um, one of the things that I think we do need to get better at, and we've talked a lot about it at this conference, is intersectionality. And one of the pieces of um, work that I'm doing is analysing the jurisprudence of each of the UN treaty committees to see to what extent they're engaging with diverse sexual orientation, gender identities, intersex status. Mm -hmm. So far I've done the Human Rights Committee, Committee on the Rights of the Child, and I've just finished the Economic, Social and Cultural Rights Committee. The next one on the, on the rank is the Disability Committee. And so I'm going to be looking at to what extent is that body engaging with diverse sexualities and, and gender identities and intersex status. And, and just by doing that research and put, shining a light on it, it gets their attention and hopefully we'll start seeing more, more happening in that space. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to take you up on that. <laughs> um, Thank you. Before I let you go, Michael, can I give you one more question, which is what are the limitations of international human rights law? Well, the limitations are that the traditional British theory... By the way, you know, I think it's... You can't keep blaming the British for these things. <laughs> our, our, our countries have been independent. Australia for a hundred and four years and uh, Sri Lanka for 50 years. Uh, we've got to look into ourselves and blame ourselves if progress isn't made. But uh, the limitations are that the British theory of international law was it was not binding on the country because it was negotiated by the executive government and hadn't gone through parliament. Uh, and unless it went through parliament, it didn't become part of the local law. That was the dual... Uh, dualism principle, uh, and that has been gradually changing. But the consequence of it was that a lot of people, a lot of lawyers, are very resistant to this. It's, then it's not so much resistance in many developed countries overseas. In fact, it's uh, boringly common for international law to be brought in by the courts. The courts are lawmakers and therefore they have a role as well as Parliament has a role. But um, the main limitation, and there are many that you could talk about, uh, is the limitation that international law is not as such part of the domestic law unless a lawmaker, namely Parliament, brings it in, and Parliament is resistant to doing that. But the answer to that is the Parliament isn't the only lawmaker. The judges are lawmakers, mm. and where it is appropriate, it's part of the role of the judge to bring international law into uh, the uh, local law, not to adopt a treaty that hasn't been adopted, but to use it as an analogical basis of r developing the common law, which is a living law, constantly evolving. And it's why the common law is in force in all the countries of the old British Empire, that was one of the blessings of the British rule, and we've got to make the best of it in Australian common law and the common law of any, every other common law country. Thanks, Michael. And Ro <laughs> I know Paula's got something to say on this, but I wanted to make sure, Rosanna, did you have anything to say about the limitations? Obviously, 
length of time for a result? It's, I don't think it's only that. It's the will of the government to actually take the uh, recommendations uh, and do something about it. Uh, for example, the UPR, since 2008, my organization, and, and we've been fighting to get decriminalized uh, way back, you know, mm -hmm. and each time they are recommended by um, the Human Rights Committee um, to decriminalize, to put in laws of uh, protection and, and uh, policies of protection and equality, but they haven't done that. So that, that is the, the, the you know, huge hurdle that some of our countries um, have to be able to change laws. Yeah. It might be different in Australia or no, no, Canada no, it's a, it's or someplace. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but um, maybe easier, I don't know. But uh, Sri Lanka definitely with the, the types of governments that we have uh, and the corruption and all of that, it's, it's, it's a bit of a nightmare. So mm. it's not an easy solution that oh, it's going to happen tomorrow. Yeah, it doesn't work that way. Yeah, okay. just to, to build on that, the whole international human rights law system is based on uh, nations consenting to be bound by it. Yes. And if, uh, you know, the UN treaty committees can make decisions till the cows come home and uh, a state is free to completely ignore it. And the example that springs to mind is Russian Fred Federation and Fedotova, where the, the human rights committee came down very clearly and said, you cannot criminalise um, holding up signs saying it's OK to be gay. And you know, Russia was like, get stuffed in probably slightly worse language. Um, so that's one problem. But another, I think, limitation of it, and the case we don't talk about uh, with much pride, is a decision in Jocelyn and New Zealand. And that was a case where the Human Rights Committee said there is no right to marriage for same-sex couples. So one of the limitations is um, you are subject to who's on the committee at the time, and that was a committee that wasn't favourable to to that viewpoint, but that was in 2001. And at that time, only one country in the world had marriage qualities. Anyone know what that country is? Chocolate. Netherlands, Netherlands. yes. Netherlands. Chocolate. <laughs> Chocolate. Chocolate. Oh, wrong. They are very difficult people. <laughs> Anything more so, before we close? Just to be strategic about the timing. Jocelyn was yeah. too soon. So make sure that you do talk to good human rights lawyers who can give you strategic advice about which committee, when, and how to do it. Yeah, that's a great point to end on. Thanks, Paula. <laughs> and I know, I know that um, the Human Dignity Trust folks are in the room as well, so they're one such source of excellent advice yep. and guidance, particularly for Rosanna, but they're there as a resource as well. I'm sure Alice yeah. has got his hand up. Yes. <laughs> yes, she has. He might get mobbed afterwards. Um, <laughs> Please join with me in thanking these distinguished and incredible advocates and jurists.